The end of the American Revolutionary War brought an end of nearly 10 years of conflict. Yet, the newly fledged nation still had many flaws. This was expressed by the first constitution and the effects spelled out from it. Yet, things are not known to be broken and less tested, and two major events occurred that tested the new nation in both laws, governance, and unity. Last week we talked about one such event, Shay's Rebellion, and in today's episode we'll be talking about the second event, the Whiskey Rebellion. The new federal government began operating in 1789, following the ratification of the United States Constitution. The previous federal government under the Articles of Confederation had been unable to levy taxes, so it had borrowed money to meet expenses and fund the Revolutionary War. They ended up massing around $54 million in debt from this, and the individual state governments also amassed an additional $25 million combined from the war and other expenses. Alexander Hamilton, the Secretary of the Treasury, proposed to combine the two debts into one and have the federal government pay off both debts. This was implemented in mid-1790, but the issue now was, how do we pay for it? Since the previous federal government was unable to levy taxes on the general populace, they instead had to impose some pretty high import duties. Import duties are essentially taxes on imported material. This was their main source of revenue. However, they were raised as high as they physically could be, so an alternative was needed. Taxes as a whole were pretty unpopular with the public, but Hamilton figured that imposing a tax on distilled beverages would be the least political detrimental of any of them to be implemented, labeling it as a luxury tax, and he managed to get support from individuals that wanted a so-called sin tax on alcohol, in an effort to raise awareness of its detrimental effects. While this wasn't a tax just on whiskey, whiskey was by far the most popular distilled beverage in the country, so it got to be known simply as the Whiskey Act. This act would go into effect in March of 1791, with its first collection due on November of the same year. This tax was immediately unpopular with people along the frontier, and the more rural parts in the western end of most states. Whiskey was a popular drink, and farmers often supplemented their incomes by operating small home stills. Farmers living west of the Appalachian Mountains distilled their excess grain into whiskey, which it was easier and more profitable to transport over the mountains than the straight grain. A whiskey tax would make western farmers less competitive with eastern grain producers too, who had the ability to operate much larger stills. Additionally, cash was also in short supply in the frontier, so whiskey often served as an exchange good. For poorer folks who were paid in whiskey, the excise was essentially an income tax that wealthier Easterners did not have to pay. It was further worsened that you either had to pay a flat fee or a price per gallon for whiskey. For the larger distilleries that could operate year-round, the flat fee was much cheaper, as they lose less money per gallon that they made. For the smaller farmers, though, both were a massive burden as normally they were too poor to pay a flat fee, and the price per gallon could be upwards of 30% of what they would be able to sell it for on the regular market. There were other aspects of the law that also caused concern, as the law required all stills to be registered, and those cited for failure to pay the tax had to appear in distant federal court rather than the local courts, and the only federal courthouse was in Philadelphia, sometimes hundreds of miles away from the individual's homes. Other grievances for many of those on the frontier only worsened approval of the federal government. The Northwest Native War was going poorly for the U.S. at the time, with them suffering heavy losses all throughout 1791. The Spanish who owned most of the land to the west of the frontier had forbade those to use the Mississippi River to transport goods, which heavily limited trading and economic opportunities. 
and the added whiskey tax just added more tension. Opposition to the tax was immediate, and they originally pushed for it to not to pass, and then when that failed, they went to the local communities to have it repealed within the region. Opposition to the tax was particularly prevalent in four southwestern counties, those being Algany, Fayette, Washington, and Westmoreland. A meeting was held by a handful of individuals at Pittsburgh in September of 1791, and they brought together a list of complaints that was then sent to the Pennsylvania State Legislature and the U.S. House of Representatives. As a result of these petitions, the law was modified slightly, reducing the cost per gallon by 1% and granting Western Pennsylvania a U.S. state representative, but it did little to quiet people's protests. Tax collectors to the region started to be physically harmed, with many of them tarred and feathered. The federal government grew more and more concerned as this progressed, and Alexander Hamilton wanted to raise federal troops to put down the resistance, but he was stopped at every turn. In August of 1792, a second convention was held in Pittsburgh to discuss resistance to the whiskey tax. This meeting was more radical than the first convention, as a group known as the Mingo Creek Association dominated the convention and issued various demands. They put in place a motion to start a revolution, if need be, and they also warned that anyone known to be aiding or supporting the collection of the whiskey tax would be harmed. In September of 1792, a tax collector by the name of George Claymer was sent to the area to investigate just how bad it actually was. His claims that we have were a bit exaggerated, and he only made the situation more tense after trying to bully local authorities, but they had a big impact on the federal response. Hamilton drafted a presidential proclamation denouncing resistance to the excise laws. George Washington himself signed the proclamation, and it was published and printed in many newspapers, but little came of it. The resistance came to a climax in 1794. As in May of that year, Federal District Attorney William Raleigh issued subpoenas for more than 60 distillers in Pennsylvania, who had not yet paid the excise tax. Under the law currently in effect, distillers who received these writs would need to travel to Philadelphia to appear in federal court. For farmers on the western frontier, such a journey was expensive, time-consuming, and pretty much beyond their means. This did get changed the following month to allow the trials to take place in local courts, but the U.S. Marshal sent out to issue these rights, a man by the name of David Lenex, was already well on his way to deliver these writs. Lenex delivered most of these writs without incident. On July the 15th, he was joined on his rounds by General Nevelle, a well-off politician and landowner in the region. That evening, shots were fired at the two, and they both retreated to Nevelle's estates. Lenox went on to report the incident to officials in Pittsburgh instead of staying, but in the morning, at least 30 Mingo Creek militiamen surrounded Nevelle's home at Bower Hill, demanding that he hand over Lenox. Instead of simply saying that he wasn't present, Nevelle pulled a classic and shot one of the rebels instead, which ended up killing him. The two sides exchanged gunfire for a bit, but the rebels retreated, gathering reinforcements for the following day. When they returned the next day, their force had swelled to roughly 600 men, under the overall command of Major James McFarlane, a veteran of the Revolution. Nivelle himself was also reinforced, this by a dozen regulars of the U.S. Army. Lennox had returned with them as well, but was captured among with a few others before the fighting erupted. After around an hour of gunfire, the house flew a white flag, and McFarlane called for a ceasefire. As he approached, however, he was shot from the house and killed, and in retaliation, the rebels set fire to the house, and the men inside surrendered. McFarlane was given a hero's funeral on July the 18th, and his murder further radicalized the countryside, and the calls for violence were getting louder and louder.
Leaders of the movement, such as individuals like David Broadford, emerged, and they started to raid wealthy landowners and U.S. federal property. They attacked a mail carrier on July the 26th as it left Pittsburgh, aiming to find which citizens rode in opposition of their movement. He called for a military assembly at Braddock Fields, just a few miles away from Pittsburgh for August the 1st. At this assembly, around 7,000 men showed up, many simply poor individuals who had nothing to gain or lose from the whiskey tax. Many were calling to march onto Pittsburgh, loot what they could, then burn the whole town to the ground, while others wanted to attack a nearby fort. Others still wanted to proclaim independence from the U.S. and join together with the Spanish or British. Bradford himself and a number of his followers wanted to bring the guillotine to America, and he modeled himself off of Robespierre, wanting to bring the reign of terror to America. Just don't tell him what happened to Robespierre. We don't want to crush his dreams. The situation was settled by help from the local citizens, who expelled three who had written in opposition to their cause. The group still marched through Pittsburgh angrily, and they burned the barns of some well-off landowners, but caused no further damage. President Washington had asked his officials what the best course of action was in terms of dealing with the unrest. And all but one official said that military suppression was the only way. So on September the 25th of 1794, Washington issued a proclamation summoning the New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Virginia militias into service, and warned that anyone who aided the insurgents did so at their own peril. He also informed the rebels that an army was approaching. The militia force comprised of around 13,000 men, which was rather large for the time. Yet few were volunteers to the militia, so a draft was used to fill out the ranks. Draft evasion was unsurprisingly widespread, and conscription efforts often resulted in protests and riots even in the eastern parts of the states. Three counties in eastern Virginia were the scenes of armed draft resistance, resulting in dozens of casualties. In Maryland, the governor sent 800 men to quash an anti-draft riot in Hagerstown, arresting 150 in the process. Liberty poles were raised in various places as the militia was recruited, and men were sent to arrest suspected pole raisers and tear them down, resulting in a myriad of civilian casualties. Washington marched with the men from September the 30th to October the 9th, where, figuring that they'd face little resistance, Command was shifted over to Virginian Governor Harry Light Horse Lee, a national hero of the Revolution. The insurrection collapsed as the Federal Army marched west into western Pennsylvania. Some of the most predominant leaders of the insurrection, such as David Bradford, fled westward to safety. While most others were acquitted due to mistaken identity, unreliable testimony, and a lack of witnesses. Only two men were convicted of treason by the federal government, but both would be pardoned by Washington, even though local courts would arrest another few dozen, but for various other charges in the rebellion. While violent opposition to the whiskey tax ended, political opposition to the tax continued. Opponents of internal taxes rallied around the candidacy of Thomas Jefferson and helped him defeat John Adams in the 1800 presidential election. By 1802, Congress repealed the distilled spirits excise tax and all other internal federal taxes. It wouldn't be until the War of 1812 that the government would rely solely on import tariffs for revenue, which quickly grew the nation's expanding foreign trade. I hope you enjoyed the brief look into one of the largely forgotten rebellions in the United States history. If there's a topic that you would like me to cover in the future, say so down in the comments below. If you would like to assist the channel in growing, then consider donating on my Patreon page. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and I'll catch you all next time.